So I'd like to uh, introduce um, Rebecca uh, Hilgenhoff from the Royal Botanical Gardens of Edinburgh. Um, she is a postgraduate programme coordinator and she has spent the last four years constructing an online multi-access key for the identification of the genus Selenum. Uh, and Selenum is a super diverse plant family found across the world. Around across the world. I won't steal too much of Rebecca's thunder, but um, Rebecca, if you'd like to like to start. Thank you very much, Billy. Well, welcome everyone um, to my talk, um, Building an Online Multi-Access Identification Key to the Mega Diverse and Economically Important Genus Selenum. Um, as Billy mentioned, I'm, I'm currently associated with uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh, and I've been working on this key for four years, so it's my great pleasure to tell you all about the key and a bit of background to Selenum as well. So let's get started. So uh, I split the presentation into four parts. Um, our first part will be the introduction and we will be looking at what is an uh, identification key and what is Solanum. Uh, then we will be moving on to the morphological characters. So the selection overview of the morphological characters recorded across Solanum and used to construct the key. Um, then we will be looking into Expert 3, um, what it is and why we've chosen it as the platform for our online key. And last but not least, uh, we will be looking at the two identification keys that we built and how they work. So what is an identification key? So the definition for an identification key um, is that it's an identification call, a tool that's primarily used to find taxon to find different taxonomic levels such as species or genera in biological science so we can eat out things like plants but also obviously animals um, minerals and these are um, tools that are based on morphology the most commonly used um, key is a dichotomous key um, a dichotomous key pro provides a set of two alternatives and at each step, the user will be given two descriptions and has to choose one of the two, out of the two descriptions, which one fits the best. So I've chosen to display an example of from Solanum. This is a dichotomous key from the Nomania group. And we've dealing here with only three species within the group. So it's an easy, straightforward key. It gives, as mentioned, uh, two alternatives. And within this couplet, the alternative chosen sends you either to your species identification or to yet another couplet uh, until the user will find the um, appropriate uh, result and hopefully the species they're looking for. Um, now looking into Solanum, before we go into the Solanum key. So what is Solanum? Um, Billy already mentioned it. Um, it's the largest genus in the Solanaceae family. It is a mega diverse genus. It is amongst the number 10 megadiverse genera of flowering plants. Um, the Solanaceae family includes 101 genera. Um, of, um, Solanum is, um, contains currently uh, 1,242 accepted species, which makes half of these um, species accepted in the Solanaceae. So out of the 101 genera, only one genus makes up half of the family. It's an uh, economically important genus um, because it includes uh, important, important crops such as the potato, the tomato and the aubergine. Um, and Solanum is made of, of 10 major and 49 minor groups, which is something that we'll get to a bit later on during the talk. However, one thing is for sure with Solanum, it is incredibly uh, diverse in terms of morphology, uh, which is something that makes actually identification um, in some cases straightforward and other cases not so much. But again, that's something we will be looking at in just a few minutes. Um, the um, Solanace, uh, what, this, the genus Solanum is um, distributed across the globe in all temperate and tropical regions. Um, but much like also, and what we're showing here is our Solanaceae source database, so I should say that. Uh, and you can see that each of the um, so Solana records that we have in our database that are here plotted are actually making up the outline of the map. So it's an incredibly widespread genus. 
Um, but not only the species within these genes are incredibly widespread, but so are our collaborators. So I wanted to put that in because, um, as you've already seen from the first slide, uh, it is a collaborative project and without the help of these people shown here and some of their predecessors, um, this entire project would probably not be possible. So all these people have been involved in various taxonomic treatments in one or the other, in, um, maybe in collaboration as well. Um, so selenum is split into 49, because it's such a humongous genus, um, as I said, it's got nearly one and a half thousand species within it. It is so much easier to comprehend um, the genus itself if we split it into smaller uh, chunks and in this place groups that we understand because of the molecular background that we have. Um, so for most of the groups we have, or for more than 50% of the species, we dare have taxonomic assessments. These taxonomic assessments provide information such as species descriptions. They provide description to the group itself, but also give an, as an idea of the distribution of these species included. And as I said, we understand that there are 49 uh, major groups at the currently, uh, current understanding. It's based on the supermatrix phylogeny that's only recently been constructed. And again, uh, a collaborative as a collaborative project because it's such a vast genus. Um, so through our collaborators and uh, data um, accessible online, we constructed a supermatrix uh, phylogeny, including 743 of the described taxa, which is 60% of the entire genus. This includes representatives of all 10 major and 49 minor groups. Um, the super phylogeny was constructed based on a nine um, molecular region, which includes two nuclear and seven plastic regions. So based on the taxonomic of of the taxonomic power of these um, modern day uh, phylogenies, we understand, for example, where our economic crops lie and what are the close relatives of these crops are and how big the groups are that our uh, crops belong to. So understanding now what species look like um, based on the species description made by botanists, we have a species phylogeny, which gives us a better understanding how species relate to each other. We can now understand how morphology works within the group, because obviously for morphology is an important component within species identification, because we need to come, we need to understand, we need to communicate, so we describe morphology. So now understanding where the morphology is um, found within in which groups, uh, which in which species, it's a very important and very crucial um, point in order to um, to tackle uh, the identification of species contained within this mega diverse genus. So what can we learn uh, from this knowledge and how can it help us to identify species? So if we look at the phylogeny, um, looking slightly different, we understand that some characters are phylogenetically restricted, so they only um, occur in certain groups. And here, a major example are prickles, um, commonly called prickles, although they're actually, um, strictly speaking, spines. These occur in 50% of the species within, within the genus Selenum, and we can therefore split the genus Selenum already in half just by assessing if there is a a prickle present or not. Um, most of the species uh, that possess prickles are part of the large leptostemonum group, which is highlighted here, although there are a few um, minor groups as well that do possess prickles. On the other hand, there are also characters that are restricted to only small um, minor groups, um, which actually define minor groups. Um, for example, we have um, the Normania group on the top left, uh, which, which is the only group where anthers possess basal appendages. Next to it, the Dorkimer group, um, we have got um, pedestal insertion, which are cup-shaped, um, which is a trait only occurring in that group. Similarly, in the tomato group, um, we find apical anther appendages, which are present in most species of the tomato group. But also we can look at hairs, for example, bent hairs are found in the gonatotrichum group. So these are very 
useful, powerful characters when it comes down to identification to the groups um, within Solanum. Although we have many of these uh, seemingly straightforward cases, um, there's also other cases though, where things are not quite as um, straightforward. And that being, for example, the germinator group. So in the germinator group, there is no defining character um, that defines all of the species um, within that certain group. So um, as I said earlier, for example, the tomato group can be distinct by um, apical anther appendages. That is a trait found in most species. However, in germinator, that's impossible because traits are present or not present. So in this cases, it is a um, a combination of traits that will allow us to identify species within this particular group. So that gives us a vast knowledge of understanding where characters lie, how um, related species share certain traits, and also it gives us an understanding how to select the characters. Um, most keys and a lot of online keys will uh, potentially use all the characters one can assess uh, within a, a species, uh, the, the plant. However, we were able to uh, whittle it down to 52 characters that are that give us enough information in order to uh, identify a single taxon of the 1,242 that we know exists in the world, or at least that we know, um, well, which have been discovered and described. But of course, there will be still some um, unknown entities out there. So our 30, uh, 52 characters or descriptors, how they are called, whether they are a software expert, um, are split into categories. So we've got, we have got one. So we asking in order to make it a bit more comprehensible, we can ask for the, the groups. So if you know the group, uh, we have a group key. So the group key can then, as I will go a little bit later on into detail, will allow us to go from the group into the species identification. Uh, we included geography as geography is an important defining character for Seleno species, and I will showcase that later. Um, we've got 21 vegetative traits, um, 19 floral, and then eight fruit traits. Um, most of these traits are categorical. Um, so, for example, we've assessed colors um, and we have defined colors into green, yellow, blues, and white. However, there's also continuous characters, um, which we've assessed, for example, anther length and filament length, and that is continuous characters where we use millimeters. Um, and um, yeah, so if you look into these characters, so our this is our 21 vegetative um, characters. Um, it starts off a growth form, includes things like rhizomes, uh, tubers, and cellopodia. As I've previously mentioned, uh, the assessment of the presence and absence of prickles. Uh, we included hairs, as it, that is a really taxonom a good taxonomically informative character to identify species within the genus. But also we included um, characters that are very um, uh, typical for certain selenium groups, such as paired leaves or pseudostipules, um, as well as interjected leaf leaves. Although, of course, broadly speaking, we're also assessing leaf traits. Um, something to not take away too much, but vegetative characters we, we regard as quite important because most of the time these will be present um, in a species assessment, whereas the following ones that we'll be discussing uh, may only be present at certain times of the year. Um, so such character is flowers. Um, although most species come from tropical regions, uh, they, they fl there is still a certain um, seasonality and for that, so flowering and might be not always um, occurring. However, within um, floral traits, we have just 19, and that includes things like the inflorescence position, uh, the presence or absence of inflorescence bracts, uh, the pedestal insertion, again, I mentioned earlier in the dogma group, um, that's a very distinguishing character. Uh, we have got things like corolla shape, the colors, um, the stamens, heteromorphism if present or absent. Our two continuous characters, the anther length um, and the filament length. Um, 
as well as we are assessing things like anther mod modifications or hairs that might be present on the anther. Furthermore, so we assessed fruit characters. Uh, we've chosen eight fruit traits. Um, this is the fruit type, uh, the shape of the fruit, um, if there's hair present uh, on the mature fruit, what type of hair, if it is present on the mature fruit. Uh, the calyx, for example, is an important character to distinguish between species. And obviously also the, pre uh, the, the type, well, uh, the different fruit colors. Um, and lastly, we've included stone cells. Stone cells are something that is very unique in solanum and is also unique to certain groups um, and can be very useful when it comes down to um, group and species identification. What we also included is geography. Um, as mentioned earlier, they occur globally. However, uh, species are restricted um, to certain continents, to certain species. Um, and it can be therefore a very powerful um, information to have that included. We have um, included two geographic traits, and by that um, we included the geographic distribution of this um, species, um, so native distribution, but also we included the cultivated distribution as we deal with a economically important um, crop species um, that is also um, very important information that one can ask. So I also want to highlight a few challenges uh, when choosing the characters. Um, so we did a homology assessment um, because one thing we did not want to do is um, or comparing apples with pears. So uh, what we wanted to do really is comparing apples with apples and understanding what are we doing? So for example, we have tubers um, in description. These are being presented as tubers. However, we're dealing with so-called um, stem tubers in, in some occasion or root tubers as for example in potato. And although we are lumping them one character, um, we will we are distinguishing within asking for the character of what the different tubers are. Um, another thing was fruit color. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, these are categorical, categorical traits that we've chosen or we have made them into categorical traits. But to distinguish between them is sometimes difficult because they are essentially continuous and it's, it's us as humans that are trying to create boxes that makes identification comprehension of certain characters easier. On the other hand, um, I, I might see a, a fruit as being orange, whereas uh, the person next to me might perceive it as being red. So that's being a bit of a challenge. Um, and I'll go into how we dealt with it when I get to that. But also, um, again, we are we're dealing with categorical characters that, that come from continuous variation. It was also important for us to understand um, to make appropriate um, categories that are easily understandable. And in this example of, of leaf type, again, it's a cont continuous trait, but in order to give the user an understanding of what um, character they should be choosing, we've provided a definition. So it goes obviously from a simple leaf that has uh, no undulation or the section on the margin to toost, which can, for example, continues various types of serration, um, but in order to make it distinguishable from lobe, to be actually quantified the lobes. So a lobe for us starts only um, if the sinus is halfway to the midrib. Um, if the sinus, though, on the other hand, is fully to the midrib, we're already going into um, pinnate uh, variation. So these are the things that we had to. Uh, think about when we were selecting the characters, uh, when we were recording the characters as well, as well as when we started to establish the key itself. So why did we decide to use an online multi-access key? Um, so um, I showed you in the beginning the dichotomous key and the problems with dichotomous keys that they may start with characters uh, that may not be present at all times. I mentioned earlier that might be the case with flowers, but that may also be the case with fruits. However, many keys, if you look at them, they actually start with characters such as, as fruits and, and, and flowers because they're most predominant features. 
Then secondly, it's obviously also the large size of the genus that makes it rather difficult to include in a key that works with couplets. Um, and again, if some of the couplets can be answers, we get stuck somewhere half between and we are unable to key out the species um, that we that we want to de-identify. And lastly, we also, as I just previously mentioned in the slide, deal with conversion traits. So there are certain traits that um, may seem to be um, the same. Um, so for our example, the tubers, however, they may not actually have the same origin, although they may look the same, but also same uh, characters that occur. Um, well, they have evolved multiple types, so these conversion traits may occur in multiple groups, which also makes it difficult to understand um, in which of, for example, two groups these occur. So again, using dichotomous keys or that we usually use um, make it rather difficult in that same scenario. Um, so we've chosen um, to go with an, uh, an online multi-access key um, and we established uh, two keys, as I have mentioned throughout the presentation so far. Um, one key um, covers 68 minor groups of solanum. Although you may ask yourself where the 68 come from, I've only previously talked about 49 minor groups or major groups that we have um, that we understand exist through the phylogenetic work. Um, we have started with these 49 groups. However, we started also to split some larger groups because we identified some morphologically distinguished groups within them. So that's why our key at the moment is up to 68 minor groups. Um, and then we have a species key that we've been installing in um, in four, um, well, they've been constructed in four as installments. Uh, we started off with all sort of uh, non-spiny species in what was regarded as a grade one before our previous phylogenetic work. And later on, we added all non-spiny solenums. And our reason in our recent installments, we also added spiny solenums that are from Africa and Asia. Um, I should also say that both the keys that we constructed both do work or are constructed with keeping in mind that one would either identify living plants or herbarium specimens. So our key is set out to work for both. So what is EXPA? Um, or what is XPR3 in our case? Um, it is a taxonomic management system um, that can be used for storage, um, addition, and online distribution of descriptions. But it also, and that's more important for us, allows the interactive identification of specimens and the creation of multi-access online keys. So why did we choose? There's multiple key um, online resources around um, that one can use um, to construct these multi online multi-access keys. So why did we end up um, choosing XPA3? It is for free, which was um, a big argument for us to use the key, um, the software. It is available online or locally in the case of XPA2. It is incredibly user-friendly and doesn't require any uh, special computer skills. Uh, the, the user can choose the characters to be observed. Identification is possible even if some characters are missing. The characters can be used in any order. The software also includes the possibility to print a single access key for field identification if required. Uh, the keys are completed with illustrations, um, pictures and drawings, and text explaining the terminology for um, easier use of the key. And the correct identification can be obtained despite errors made by the user. Last but not least, characters are weighted according to the skills and, ab and abilities of the audience. And we have set up our key uh, not only for Solanum experts or um, trained botanists, but we want our keys to be usable by anyone in the world that comes across a solanum and wants to identify it. In order to help our users along, uh, we have um, made this little quick guide to the online keys that it gives you, um, well, it shows you the layout and the options available to the user in terms of selecting characters, 
how it can be used in, in terms of submitting character search um, and what are the main characters um, that we deem are necessary to be used if that is a possibility. So how does the online multi-access key work? Um, so on the left-hand side here, you can see um, the interface of the key uh, for the Selenium groups. It gives you a, a number of characters, but you have also the ability to scroll down, um, which I will be doing in a second because we will be looking at some examples of here. It's, uh, it's a key that's interactive, it's online. So I want to show you what we've done, uh, the results um, of our work but also uh, give you a bit of a flavor of how it works. Um, but essentially we'll be presented with the characters. We have weighted the characters according to the importance. So we have put geographic, excuse me, geographic, geographic distribution on top um, um, of the key as the first character that one would see, just because it's very likely that you are either having information on the herbarium voucher um, of where the specimen comes from, or you are in the country of origin and seeing that specimen, uh, that living specimen in front of you, so you know where it is and understanding where it comes from can already narrow it down quite a lot from the nearly one and a half thousand species within the genus. Uh, the second one is prickles. Again, we've seen earlier that by, uh, that by knowing if there's prickles present or not, that we can easily divide our search result by nearly 50%. So dividing, you know, the, the genus as well as our search by 50%. And then we've got very apparent things like fruit color, leaf shape that's always present, growth form that should be always present, but also um, corolla color. Um, here, the example of fruit color. Mm. As I mentioned previously, um, our the um descriptors or the characters um they're called descriptors within the key um each descriptor has a, a explanation in terminology so we've looked at terminology i've told you earlier we looked into defining the characters a bit and how we've decided to find the characters the text will help you along with that but not only does the text help you along with that we also have that um character plate um that will allow you to understand how we have defined fruit colors. And this will become even more apparent if we then, um, if we happen to use this as a character, we look at what characters we're choosing within fruit color and within our different color components, we give you again, a bit more information text required, but you can also as a user easily see from the, um, from the image, what colors we specifically, um, oh, <laughs> what different types of shapes we specifically include in certain um, color traits. Um, there are also characters that work on dependency. Um, so we, I've mentioned earlier that there's 52 different characters that are assessed across both of the keys. However, the character prickles, for example, um, which has got um, various uh, sub assessments if character prickle is not being ticked or assessed as being present these will not be be given as an option to the user itself so if you go into and that's what hopefully comes across in my illustration here if we would tick um, that we have prickles uh, absent that would not bring us further to asking the question where there's prickle placement because obviously there's an absence of prickles and nor will it ask for prickle type Whereas, of course, if you go, um, there's prickles present, it can then ask um, for the questions, um, which I think is, is, a, is a great thing to have within that key because um, it eliminates um, areas if they're not necessary. So let's have a look at an example. And I thought we start, start an example of the group key. Um, and I've chosen this particular plant here. And I just want to run you through some characters that I will be choosing when we're going into the key and um, so you understand what they look like. So we've got yellow flowers here. Um, I can see we've got uh, the basal anther appendage. Um, these are immature fruits, so I wouldn't take the root color in account, but I can see here that they have got um, calices that are not a crescent, so they're not enlarged or inflated as it can be in some species. 
I can see that the inflorescence is divided is once forked, and we're dealing with a compound leaf that has a, a, a toothed margin, and I can also see here the interjected leaves in between. Equally, if I look a bit to the background, I can see it's an inter internode inflorescent. So if I just go out of this for you, and we are going to the key, hang on, the group key. Um, so not knowing the ge geography, it's something that's not very helpful. But what I saw there, if for example, is that I have no prickles present, so it's a character I can choose. You can see on the right hand side, it says 68 remaining taxa. So these are all our 68 groups we can identify. And when I now select the character as being absent, it gives me the option to submit. And that will now be locked in my history. And now all of a sudden on the right hand side, you can see I'm down to 53 remaining taxa. Um, then furthermore, we've been given the option of, of leaf shape, um, which was present. So I said it was a compound leaf with two margin. So if I now I select that and submit, uh, we have already got a result, uh, which is the tomato slate. And we can already see, um, I will show you that quick in, in the one second in the PowerPoint interface rather than here. But we included also um, image plates in the results so the user can actually, with one look, identify if the species it will want to identify um, is part of this group or not, because they are relatively distinct between the groups. Um, I believe that up to you. Hopefully, you all will be looking into the key and using the key, so please do feel free to explore that. Um, one thing to be highlight, you can see here we have got our history and we can always eliminate characters or change characters with our history in case we didn't get the search result. And again, the reason why we also deal with solanum groups rather than just talking a solanum as a humongous genus, it is just helps us easier. To, well, it provides digestible junks, junks of identification. So I know now um, that um, we in the tomato group and if I go back in here, um, the tomato group, it tells me it's got 17 species. So I've already been down from 1,242 species down to 17. I can now go into my, and I will do that quickly actually, because I think it's a nice um, a nice example um, into the key. Um, but I can look for characters down here. So if I put in a group, um, it will give me minor and major group often options. Um, if I now look for minor group, I've asked for minor group and it gives me the minor groups. Unfortunately, we're a bit slow with the loading of the images, but I can immediately in the, in the species level key use the tomato group as a character. So our, our key, it contains 752 um, different species. However, if I determine, um, tomato group as a character and I submit that again, we will get it down to the 17 species and then we get um, the question for other appropriate characters to be asked for species of belonging to that particular group. Um, if I just go back to my presentation. Um, Here we go. Um, there's our example again, and I promised you I would show you this search result in one slide. So again, it gives you an understanding of, well, an, an overview of what the characters within the group, this this case to major group looks like. You can see they're all um, yellow flowered species. Some examples are fruits, but also equally, as we know, vegetative characters are equally important. It gives you also a bit of a flavor of what the vegetative morphology in this group looks like. And um, as you can already make out, most of the species actually um, possess what we consider as being compound or um, seemingly compound leaves. And what I've already uh, mentioned earlier, it gives you a bit of a little description. It's a group of 17 species. Um, it gives you a bit more of, a, of um, background so the user can decide if we had the right search result or not. Equally, it gives you a, underneath a consensus of of all the descriptors that we have assessed and what the individual traits are within these. 
And the group key is linked to the species level key. As I said previously said, it's very important to cut the lane into chunks to make it a comprehensible. And we have linked to two keys by providing uh, an high, well, it's not hyperlink, but we're writing a link within the one key so we can then move from one key onto the next key. What we will be doing now as well. So we have the species level key that we just looked at um, earlier because I just wanted to make a point how, um, how helpful it is to know which group our species belongs to. Um, so, as I previously said, our group key currently um, contains 752 species, which is about 55% um, of the genus. We have started method. Um, well, no, that's the word I'm looking for. We've 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 started in a way that we are dealt with certain groups uh, where we have morphological data for. That's the reason why we started with all non-spiny taxa, uh, which includes um, the crop white relatives, for example, of the potato and the tomato, but also now starting to include the spiny species have started on the Asian African ones because we just have a bit more uh, understanding. Whereas the other groups, for example, um, from uh, spiny species from Australia, and Asia, we still underway with the taxonomic work. So we are waiting until it's done so we can add more uh, data to our key, which is the other really positive aspect about using this online key is that we can alter it all the time and can use our improved understanding to uh, reflect that in the key. And again, to make identification for or the helping identification for our users to be um, more and more straightforward. Um, so if we look in the example. So I've chosen this as an example. Um, this is an example. Uh, it's a native species. I took these pictures here in Edinburgh, the water of leaf. Um, you can see it's got red fruits. Uh, well, fruits are turned from green to orange to red. Obviously, we only considering the mature fruit color. We've got these purple flowers, um, seemingly no alteration to the appendages. We have got something here um, around um, the 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 answers and the base of the corolla um, that might be of interest. And we've got cut plate insertion here. Uh, it seems to be um, a scrambling shrub um, looking at the habit of it. So if we again do the same thing as earlier and we're going out, um, we're going to our key um, and I'm just going to take care of the history that from our previous search here we go um we have got we are back to our 752 taxa and this time again geography is on the top this time geography um information is present because i told you we are finding ourselves in edinburgh uh, we've used uh this taxonomic information based on the taxonomic database um so to make it um uh, to use a system that's also used within botanical language as such. So we're using the level one and level two tier. So we're dividing it into largely our continents. And then with our continents areas, such as Europe, we have Northern Europe, Middle Europe. Um, here, much like the other characters, it, it actually also gives us some description or some countries that are part of these. So if we look at, at Northern Europe, we find the UK, so we're finding ourselves in the UK. If we now use it as a character and we press submit, we're now down to 10 remaining taxa from our 7500, um, uh, sorry, 752 species. So you can see how powerful it is actually to know where your taxon is or where it comes from. Um, now, if we continue further, we did see fruits um, that were in the orange to red category, so we can use that as a character. Um, then um, we have got, um, whoop, I wanted to look at Corolla shape. Um, I'm going to look for it because it's not. Uh, corolla color because it's not being presented to me. Um, go back to the top. Here we go. There's our corolla color. It was purple. Um, we submit that now. We're now down to two species: um, Solanum documrara and Solanum villosum. Um, we have the growth form. 
um, I said it was a shrub. Um, we submit it now. We've got to look for so look, we lose them. So if we now look at it, um, we do have a um, result, but we can see from our result that actually I must have made a mistake there along the line because it's quite clearly not the character, uh, the species that we were looking for. But this is again why we included these photographic plates because we want to say, I can see, no, it is definitely not my species because it does look nothing alike. So um, if we go back and I just take the last character out to go back to that, I mean, essentially it can also look now uh, what the other one looks like as well, um, which we can do. And we can see it's actually a species we're looking for. Um, so again, if we are not even having our down to our search result per se, we can by looking through already see, am I on the track? Am I ha having the right species? With now only two remaining, that's an easy thing to do as well. However, there are other characters, obviously, that will help me to bring it down to the one species in that particular case. Because as I said to you, we had this markings, which weren't easily visible. My apologies, I've seen the species in, in person. But we have got these um, corolla spots which occur here on the bottom left, which I know the species has. And it's very unique and only occurs in a few species. So if I now use that, uh, I will get our Solanum dolcomara. So as we are now done with the keys, I just go back to um, my presentation. Here we go. Um, so again, we have similar as in our uh, group search, we have got the species result. Uh, it gives us our photographic plate and it gives us all the characters that we have assessed for that particular species. So now that we looked at that, I just want to uh, make sure that everyone who's in the audience today knows how to find us. So, and that's quite easy, simple Google us. So if you put in Solanium identification key, what will pop up is the Solanaceae source. So Solanaceae source, it's a, a, um, a site that's run both by um, people within the Natural History Museum in uh, London, as well as here at the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh. But it's a huge collaborative project as a lot of researchers in the past, present, and hopefully in the future have contributed to the vast knowledge that we find there. Um, if you go onto the website, um, you have tabs and there's a tab saying identification key. I also put the link in here just for everyone if you want to um, find it a bit easier. Um, and when you go into the tab, it will give you the global key to the groups and the global key to our um, non-spiny solano species and the spiny species of tropical Africa and Asia. Um, it also provides some more resources. So do go have a look at the website. It's a, as I said, it's a really re neat website. Um, in terms of um, identification within the, um, sorry, I'm just going to go back. So within the, um, the text we're providing to each uh, search result here, what we also have provided is a link back to our Solanaceae source uh, website because what Solanaceae source has, and I'm going forward again, apologies for that, is we have for, for a lot of species, species descriptions. So whilst we're only dealing with 52 characters, there's obviously more characters that make up that species. And if you want to see a full species de description, um, I would recommend, you can obviously find that in the species protolog or maybe in flora accounts or taxonomic accounts, but you may also find it in online form here on the Solanaceae source website. Um, also here you find uh, a number of uh, images for a lot of the species that we have got inputted over the years. And that brings me to the end of my talk uh, already. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and also before I actually um, let Billy go ahead with the question round, I just want to say thank you to all these people here in the uh, acknowledgements and specifically uh, Tina Sakinin and Sandra Knapp who have been um, my uh, supervisors for the project over the past four years and also and I cannot believe I've not put it on here I also want to do say a big thank you to the Civil Trust uh, because they have funded so far um, the um, research fellowships and made it possible to construct these two keys. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you for that brilliant talk, Rebecca. That was really exciting. What, what a brilliant resource that is. Um, so there, there was one question which um, came up in the Q&A, uh, which I was also going to ask, um, and it's 
to your knowledge, do you know whether or not any other key exists um, for like any other taxonomic group like this? Or um, you mean specifically uh, with the software expo that we've used as well, or generally speaking? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, I, I suppose, or, or or generally speaking, if, if there is. There are things like Neotropic Key, uh, which is, I think, hosted by Tropicos, uh, which deals with, um, it's also a multi-access key. It's, um, they're using a different software, which I'm not quite sure what it's called yet. So, um, and I don't want to say anything wrong. So, but it's worthwhile Googling that and checking it out. It works as a multi-access key as well. It deals with a lot of genera species from the tropics. Uh, when it comes down to Expert, there are multiple keys out there. Um, we have in the botanics another colleague who has now started the same thing with Sachandra, a large genus in the Gisneriaceae family. Uh, so that will be hopefully coming uh, online um, and freely accessible. Um, there are other keys as well available for export, and I really recommend everyone to look for it. There is, for example, one for the ladybirds of France. I think uh, there was also, and I'm not sure which for which geographic area, but there was also a key for orchids. Um, terrestrial orchids I think in Europe but I don't remember quite which region Europe so they're out there um, and also some of them and hopefully our key soon as well they come with papers um, and providing a bit more information for users. Brilliant thank you. Um, I have one question is this key uh, is it available in other, la la other languages or is it just in English? Not at the moment uh, so um, we, because we have collaborators across the globe and a lot of the species you've seen from the species uh, from the distribution map that I showed, there's a lot of species diversity in the tropics. So our idea, and obviously that will be more a bit fun funding dependent as well, but our idea would be to translate it into uh, languages as Spanish and Portuguese because to make it then applicable for these people living in the countries as well where these all the vast amount of species come so that we then enable species identification and hopefully our collaborators that are located in these areas will be able to help but it would mean to establish an extra key and it takes some time to get that vast amount of species and and to get it all translated so that would be something that we're working towards through in well a bit in the future well yeah it'd be a massive amount of work <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, so Jackie Carter has asked, and there's been a, a, another question of a similar nature, how does the geographical section of the key treat non-native slash introduced species? Is, is that something that's covered by the, the cultivated? Um... Yeah, exactly. That will be covered by the cultivated. Um... So it's obviously, it's a bit difficult to understand if a species is native or not. Um, I think when something is a bit more in an agricultural cultural background, I think it's easier. So what we have done in some cases actually is to broaden the distribution a bit. And I'm not saying cheeky with that, but just being able to include information because we're not saying this is the, the taxonomic description that we're providing here, but we have a key in order to make a key out. So in some cases, we may not necessarily be restricted to just the native distribution, but we broaden it to potentially non-native distribution as well. Because the problem is, although, as I've um, showcased, we can go back in the history and take out certain characters if we don't come to the species, uh, to the search result. One thing we've also learned from having worked with Exeter now for three years is that if we have characters to narrow, and that could include distribution, for example, that means it eliminates our potential result. So we have broadened some characters and in the same vein have done that with distribution as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so Amy M asks, was the first step to research genetic groupings of species or was it to um, look at the morphology of them first when it came to creating multi-accessible? Uh, just by, by the, it was a really nice question. By the nature of things, uh, it was taxonomic uh, treatments that were there first. I uh, think it's just by the nature of us understanding and how tools evolve. I mean, you know, uh, molecular tools in the last 20 years have come a long way but before and they were not so well they weren't present or they were really financially unachievable so it's all based on morphology uh, what we're now getting is obviously having that backbone of molecular data because also as i said earlier with convergent traits sometimes you have traits that you think links to species but then we understand for example um 
my favorite example of convergent evolution, that the lotus is actually not that closely related to a water lily just because it's two plants that find themselves in the water, right? It's a trait that they're involved to. So what it does now for our and what it means is we can now get this back, both take our information of species understanding or what we think our species and plot them on this phylogeny and see, for example, that we have traits that have potentially evolved twice. And actually doesn't mean that these two species or these two groups are closely related. Um, so we are now, so what I'm trying to say with this um, a bit longer, but no lasting answer is that we are improving everything. So, and that's the nice thing about uh, our key as well, as I said, it's electronic and we can constantly improve it. So. For example, we have now built a phylogeny of only 50% of the species. The more species data we're adding, the more of the better resolutions we should be getting because there's still areas within there which we're not 100% sure how species or groups are related to. Um, or equally, we're now also in the age of where we can um, uh, sequence entire genomes, right? We can look at the entire genetic information and we're only looking at seven regions of each uh, species. So if you add more information of that, might, that might get a different picture. So what we think might be closely related today, we may know tomorrow they're not. So what the key can do being electronically online, we can update that and constantly provide the most up-to-date information. Brilliant. Um, so another question has come through, um, which is kind of in a similar vein to what we just talked about, is um, did the key require or make any new um, molecular research, you know, for, for making a key of this size, you know, did, did you have to do any new work to try and um, make it more? Not in that, uh, yes, I know what you mean. So not in that sense, it, in some way. So it, it hasn't really gone, hmm. Not in the sense that we have gone back to molecular side of things and had to redo things. Uh, what it though helps us with is, is is the information that is the backbone of the key is the the morphological understanding. As I said earlier, in and I think I said it quite quickly, it's one thousand two hundred and forty two species that are described, but there's still an increase of species description occurring every year. And what it allows us to do without sequencing that particular potentially newly found and described species, we can preliminarily put it in one of the groups because we have that morphological understanding of these groups. As I said, some groups are defined by individual characters or a combi set combination of characters that we know now. 